right, hello, Slush, Luciana, Andrew, such a joy to do this, and a, and a huge thank you for joining us here on stage today. Thank you so much. We're so thrilled to be here and to be able to do this in person. It's such a treat. Agreed. It's great to have you. So, as you just heard, we're here to talk about the like deeply important announcement that was the um, Sequoia Capital Fund uh, very recently. Uh, but before you get going, I thought we'd set the scene and perhaps break the ice a little bit. Um, so, so Luciana, Andrew, you're both partners at Sequoia, but how did each of you actually first make your way into the world of venture? So, I joined Sequoia about eight years ago, and. Uh, I'm based in our California office, and for me, the drive has always been a general curiosity about business writ large and trying to figure out this dynamic mosaic of the, the world's economy and uh, in this era of accelerating change, how different founders and companies fit into it. So for me, that's led me into all sorts of different directions on the investing side. So I work with software companies like Figma and Loom, Product Board, Vanta, Sourcegraph, Zapier, fintech companies like Robinhood, global internet companies like Bolt and Rappi, and the fun thing about this job is there's always some new thing to explore tomorrow. Absolutely. And my story is a bit different. So I'm from a small town in Romania, and I did not grow surrounded by technology or venture capital. And I have a fun fact. I was talking to a friend yesterday. I realized my mom still does not have an email address. So just to, to share some background, I thought I'd teach math. And honestly, for me, it was luck and serendipity. I, um, I started in venture. So I started investing back in 2009. And I started with later stage investing at a, at a firm called Summit. And I started in venture in earlier stage a decade ago, back in 2011. I was with Excel for eight years, and I joined uh, Sequoia a bit of, uh, almost a year and a half ago now. Um, and um, it's, uh, it's been a treat to see how the European ecosystem evolved over a decade, and I was very privileged to work with founders that, in my opinion, really helped shape the ecosystem, like Will at Deliveroo and Daniel at UiPath and Andrea at Miro and many others. So it's been a, it's been a fun journey, and um, it's changed a lot, but I'm sure we'll talk more about that. Absolutely. So if, if we here in Helsinki sometimes feel like we're coming out of a fringe ecosystem, your story beats that out of the <laughs> pond. But let, let's, draw, let's dive into the announcement of the Sequoia Capital Fund. And uh, just to contextualize this for the audience, um, I thought I'd just explain how a, a venture capital fund traditionally works, because um, Sequoia Capital Fund is different. So many of you will know that venture capital is a private equity offspring, um, which was sort of created back in the, back in the 60s and 70s. And so most venture capital funds are 10-year funds, and they're closed-end funds. And what that means is that limited partners, that's people that invest into venture capital funds, put their money in, and then they're basically stuck for the next 10 years. Like, as uh, the fund uh, exits portfolio companies, they will start paying that money back, and then they'll try and do that paying back over a total period of 10 years. But now, the Sequoia Capital Fund, the big news is that you have chosen to do a thing or structure yourselves differently. So tell me, how is Sequoia Capital Fund structured? Sure. Uh, before diving into the details of what the Sequoia Capital Fund is and how it works, it's worth describing the why, because Sequoia has been around for almost 50 years. It's been, uh, I think, 49 years since Don Valentine made Sequoia's first investment, which was into Atari, the gaming company. And for us to contemplate a transformation of our business like this, there's obviously a compelling reason that we found to do so. And it starts with our mission. So our mission at Sequoia is to help the daring build legendary companies from idea to IPO and beyond. And the backbone of the Sequoia Capital Fund is the legendary companies. So I think our, our history has taught us that these amazing, enduring companies can surprise any of us to the upside and compound for decades. Companies like Google and Apple and Cisco and Oracle and those sorts of companies. And in the context of those businesses, 10 years is truly an arbitrary number. It's a nice number to do math against, right? Like, but it could be 12, it could be 15. In any event, it is an imposition of our fund structure that's untethered to the way companies scale and operate. And uh, we, you know, we thought about different models, and the reality is the, what we landed on was just to upend the closed-in fund structure entirely. And the Sequoia Capital Fund, for a little bit of the detail on how it works, is an open-ended fund that holds a selection of public positions in our most enduring companies. And beneath that are a series of closed-in funds. It's seed investing fund, early stage investing, growth stage, expansion stage. And the reason for those funds is 
you know, we're not interested in being in the money management business. You know, we want to help the daring build legendary companies from idea to IPO and beyond, which means making the best seed investments we possibly can with a focused seed effort. And the nice thing about this model is as those companies scale up, you know, we partner with Stripe at the seed or Airbnb at the seed, as those companies get really big, they can mature out of the closed-end funds into the open-ended fund. And for subsequent closed-end funds, uh, those are fed by the open-ended fund. So it's a, it's a novel structure, and it's one that we believe creates the first genuine crossover fund in our industry, starting with seed all the way to Publix. And it should be great for, uh, for our founders so we can be their longest term investors and also great for our LPs. Why I think this is so important and fitting on the slush stage is, is obviously the third tenet of our theme, uh, Entrepreneurial Renaissance, is called Innovation Reborn, uh, which is all about building incredibly, like taking huge technological risk and often huge technological risk, what you might call deep tech, um, you know, doesn't materialize within 10 years. But Luciana, so like, what does this announcement mean for founders? What changes for founders? From our perspective, we, we've always invested in the same thesis that we, we want to find founders who want to build iconic companies, want to build generational companies. So we, we look at the same type of companies, we try to invest early and try to invest with a found, with, to work with our founders for the long run. The difference is, is exactly what Andrew said earlier, there is no deadline. We can start partnering with founders and think about a really long-term relationship. Again, especially when we invest at seed, building a generational company takes decades so now we're able to be part of the journey for decades okay very good and um, then I want to put the question to you like why has it taken 50 years for us to get here because as you mentioned you know Sequoia was founded in 1972 that's about that's around the time when sort of venture capital came to be so uh, like w w why why was this the right moment for you to do this I guess is my question I'm happy to answer this because I actually, since I joined Sequoia a bit over a year ago, it was you know, a period of discovery and getting to know um, how our, our culture. Um, and one of the things that I find really impressive and really fascinating is a constant design des uh, desire to reinvent it itself. I think it's normal human psychology that when things are going well, you try to do more of the same. But the culture at Sequoia is not that. The culture is how do we break it down and then build it up again better? How do we change? How do, re how do we re reinvent ourselves? And it's really interesting because it's actually something I look for in founders. It's a trait I look for in founders. So it's, um, it's really nice to be part of a culture that thinks about the world this way. What I will say in terms of timing, we've always thought really long term. Now we, we actually change the structure to reflect that. But that was always our philosophy. <laughs> and what I would add on that is, um, you know, this isn't the first time that Sequoia has done something novel or innovative or that people have called wacky. And, you know, you think back to things like expanding internationally, things like going from a seed investing business to a growth investing business to having a public equities business, um, to having a scout fund. You know, these are things that Sequoia was, you know, the, the, start, the first scout fund was the Sequoia sc uh, scout fund. And there's a question that Patrick Carlson from Stripe actually posed at an offsite we had recently, which is, what would Sequoia say if Sequoia were on Sequoia's board? Because with the companies we work with, we do try to push them to think bigger, be creative, be different. And we take that same approach to running Sequoia. Like, we are entrepreneurs at heart and want to take risks with everything we have. And I have to say, I think this really resonates with the founders that we work with and the founders that we want to work with. Because after this announcement, I got so many calls and so many messaging, messages saying exactly this. Firstly, delighted to be able to work with Sequoia for the long term. But secondly, so nice to see that there is the same entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial mentality on the venture side, to, to echo what Andrew was talking about. Absolutely. All right, so then I wanted to put a quote forth from uh, Doug Leone, who, who manages uh, Sequoia Capital. Uh, he said, Doug has said, uh, Sequoia is a team, not a, not a family. Um, so my question is like, how does the team at Sequoia make decisions together? What is your decision-making process? And, and specifically, how does that change depending on the size of check or the, uh, the, the sort of uh, stage of investment that you're making? Yeah, so Doug, uh, we have 10 tenets at Sequoia that define our culture, and Doug has mentioned this a few times. There are two that we talk about all the time. Number one is performance. And Doug likes to say, if you don't have number one, the other nine don't matter. 
need to be a great investor, deliver great returns to our LPs, and be a great partner to founders. And number two is teamwork. And our version of teamwork at Sequoia, I think, is different than the way many venture funds think about teamwork. And to use um, some tired sports analogies, mm -hmm. I think there is one version of teamwork which is like a golf team, where you have a bunch of people who play their ball, and at the end of the day, you add up the scores, and that's the score of the team. That's not how we think about teamwork. We think about it more like soccer or rugby or, or, or basketball, where for any given opportunity, we all try to work together um, to get the best possible results. So for like a tangible example, recently we invested in Bolt here in Estonia, and that was an investment that was first nudged to us by Mike Moritz, and it was Luciana who had the relationship, and she and I worked on it together with a partner in NAS, and I led the investment for Sequoia, and that's kind of the way we do things. And yes, I'm in California and they're in Europe, but we are one team. And for us, the teamwork, a lot of it is in that decision making, trying to figure out which investments to make. But if you think about it, over the last couple of years, that decision making process has gone from weeks to days. And with the Sequoia Capital Fund, our tenure of working with companies has gone from years to decades. Mm -hmm. So the vast majority of teamwork happens actually after the investment. And uh, when companies go public, we tend to send around an internal email, just, hey, who's done what for the company? Let's make sure that we give proper credit where credit's due. And for a lot of these companies, it's not uncommon for 20 or 30 people from Sequoia to have worked on the company between the moment we first invested at a very early stage all the way up through the point of the IPO. And with the, with, the, with the Sequoia Capital Fund, the point of the IPO really is just a milestone. And you can presume the same thing is going to happen many years into the future. So building on that, let's perhaps switch gears a little bit here. And let's talk about some of the sort of tectonic shifts uh, molding venture capital um, at the moment. And I think the most, uh, the most striking is just the, um, the hugely increased availability of capital. So I think Europe is on track to, uh, in Europe specifically, we're on track to 100 billion invested this year compared to 40 billion last year. So that's two and a half times growth in just one year, which is, which is an exceptional pace. So there's more capital available than ever. Uh, how should founders think about uh, the fundraising market and, 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 and capital uh, in, the, in this new environment? I have to say, having been in venture for a decade in Europe, it's just absolutely wild how, how much has changed from many perspectives. And yes, absolutely, availability of capital is one of them. I think it's uh, two sides to the same coin. On the one hand, I think it's really positive for, for the ecosystem or for the many European ecosystems because it's not just one here. I think it's great because founders that might not have had an opportunity before now do. They have access to capital to, to give it a real shot and to build their companies. So I think that part is great. I think on the other side of the coin is just being thoughtful about when to fundraise and who to fundraise with and trying to keep some discipline. I really believe strongly that having some constraint when it comes to capital and in general keeps the mind really clear and really focused on prioritizing and, and what really matters and investing your, your time and your money in what really matters. So our, our advice to our founders is always, okay, do you need the capital is the first question and, and let's have that conversation. And the second question is, is, is this a really value add new investor? Is this going to change your, your destiny or maybe that's too much to say, but is it going to shortcut your way to success? So those are the type, types of conversations we like to have with our founders. And um, I think that staying sober for us investors, for founders in an environment that just moves so fast um, is really, really important. So I would say they're, they're, it's mostly good for the ecosystem, but it's also important to keep the mind clear and keep some discipline. I'm sorry if it's a boring answer, but it's a genuine uh, answer from the heart as opposed to go raise $2 billion. <laughs> let me continue on, on that, actually, and let me ask the same question from the venture capitalist perspective, so your perspective. Like, so let's think about it. You know, in, in one year, we've had, uh, we're going to see two and a half times more funding in Europe. It's probably, or it's intuitively probably true that there's not two and a half times more good equity to go around. And the end result of that is, you know, venture capital probably is becoming more competitive. And you can take issue with the framing. But like, how does that affect your work, just the fact that uh, there is uh, there's probably more people competing for the deals you do? Do you want me? Go ahead. So, uh, so I'll give you a European view, and maybe you can share a bit from the US. How about that? Um, 
I would say that actually there are a lot more wonderful founding teams today than ever before. Um, I think it's, it, it's just a cultural shift. Europe always had really strong education, really strong technical talent, but now people are willing to take the risk. They're not going into corporates or into consulting or banking any longer. They, they work for a startup, they get some experience, and then they, they're willing to take, a, take the risk and build their own company. So I don't know if the number is two and a half times proportional to, to the, the amount of capital increase, but I will say, it's like on a daily basis, I just get so many introductions to really, really strong founding teams, much more so than five years ago in the European ecosystem. So I would say that there is a balance between the, the number of great founding teams and the amount of capital available. Um, now, on the other hand, you know what? We, we try to just think about what, we, what happens within the building, and we just try to, the, the, what I said on discipline, we apply that to ourselves as well. We just want to find wonderful founders at seed and be really good company builders. We think of ourselves as company builders, not only investors, and work with these founders for the long run. And we just try to keep a clear mind every time we wake up, every single morning, and focus on this, as opposed to focusing too much on, on what's happening in, in, uh, in the world around us. I will say, we each make two to three investments a year, probably. We don't each make, you know, we don't issue a term sheet a day, I'll say that. So I think that we, we pick and choose very selectively the, the companies where we really spend time and the companies where we invest. And when we do, we put the entire weight of Sequoia behind those founders. Yeah, I would just add, um, when I started Sequoia eight years ago, it was fairly common to see a new investment opportunity and have a week to do some market diligence, do a few meetings, talk to customers, get a data room, wade through that, figure out what you think. And the reality is, is that timelines have just gotten compressed. And you know, founders often think of us as just the investor side of the table. We work with each of us, probably a dozen companies that are also raising money. So we know how painful fundraising can be from the founder perspective. And with the compressed timeline and greater competition, that's really a wonderful thing. And the era of being able to sit back and take your time to understand things, that's gone. You have to be prepared. You have to move very quickly with a lot of conviction when, these, uh, when you meet some of these companies. And that's how we love to do business. Like we, um, we are, I think if you ask the founders we work with, we tend to be very fast on email. We tend to be willing to get on planes. We tend to, uh, uh, be very direct and straightforward when we're making new investments. And I think in this new era, it really suits the way we like to do business. So I think from the US perspective, yes, it's more competitive, but I think at the very least, it's good for founders, and I think it makes our job pretty fun too. And what I will say is, I, I say this to, to the founders that I work with and to anyone who, who might want to listen, you are making a big decision as a founder. You are choosing a partner for the following 5, 10, 15 years. Making that decision within two to three days might not be always a great idea. Of course, if you build a relationship over time and you get to know in the investors over time and then the actual fundraise happens in a short period of time, that, that's a very different scenario. But um, I also always try to, to have an honest conversation with founders and tell them, by partnering, we're not just giving you capital, we're committing to you and to your journey and to be behind you for a very long time. So let's take more than two to three days to get to know each other and to see that we think about the world in a similar way. I think that's really important. Speaking about uh, sort of compressed uh, fundraise timelines, which obviously for you imply, you know, compressed decision-making timelines, like with that being said, I'm sure there are situations in which you do need to act fast because there are competitors who would um, and they'll take the deal if you don't. Sure. So how do you as a fund ensure that you approach each inv investment with that same level of like rigor and analysis when you have to act faster than, than ever before? I think it's not about learning about a company and making a decision 24 hours later. Like that is just not a great way to make excellent investments. I think it's about having a prepared mind and being willing to do work, whether it's building connection with a founder or understanding a market and a landscape before there's any sort of a fundraise. So when there is the chance, you can jump on it. So I think that is probably the difference. And in terms of how it affects our business, like, yes, there are more rounds being done and more dollars being invested, but as Luciana said, each of us make two or three new investments a year. 
it really is uh, not a market thing. It's a company by company thing. And we take performance incredibly seriously. Like it is our number one tenant. And uh, it's something that we look at. And the reason for that is our limited partners are, the vast majority are nonprofits and schools. And we really take pride in delivering excellent performance for them because they're great causes and our performance really matters to them. And I think some of this data is public uh, with the Sequoia Capital Fund uh, news. You know, one of the reasons we're able to do that is currently in our private funds, we have $45 billion of public positions, of which $43 billion are gains. So on $2 billion of cost basis, we have $45 billion of publics, and that's not counting uh, the private positions that are still in the funds. And on top of that, for the last, um, I think for the last 15 years, we've been a net source of liquidity for our LPs. So we've uh, distributed to them more than twice what, we, what we've invested. And I think that general philosophy of just being extremely performance focused is, I think, the core of what Sequoia is. And when it comes to things like making decisions on companies, we don't view it as, oh, just another investment, just another company. We view it as, on an individual level, one of the two or three new things we're going to do in any given year, and on an aggregate level, the only thing that matters. And on the flip side, if I'm a founder, and I reach out to an investor and I say, hey, you have to decide within two to three days, that, that's, you know, also for, for the investor, you, I think it's a good test to see the reaction. Because if an investor thinks about this as, hey, I'm going to partner with you for the next 10 years, if that's the mindset, and I'm actually really going to work with you, and I'll roll up my sleeves, and I'll be a great partner and a great board member, if that's the mentality, making that decision as much as making the, the capital decision within two days is much more unlikely. So actually, I, I take that, you know, if, if you're a founder, see how, your, how investors react when you approach them with those types of timelines. So one of the um, follow-on effects of the general increase in speed in the, in the ecosystem and the fundraising process is um, that funds, venture capital funds, are also being deployed faster. So one of the questions I want to ask you is, uh, in this environment, how do you think about your own kind of pacing and speed uh, of how you deploy your, your, your funds? So I don't, I don't think that those two things are equal, meaning an increased pace in the fundraising environment does not necessitate an increased pace in our funds. And I think I would echo back the comments I just made, which is, you know, we are extremely focused on de delivering exceptional multiple of money returns to our LPs and being great partners to founders. And within that, I think pace tends to take care of itself. All right, that's loud and clear. We so, ask some discipline of our founders, so we have to show some discipline on our side as well, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so then switching gears once more, um, it's quite interesting to, um, uh, or I think it's interesting to ask a question from you about the sort of biggest failures or the biggest misses uh, as, as venture capitalists. So what was each of you, Luciana and Andrew, what was your big miss and how did that change your like, mindset and approach as, as venture capitalists after that? Mine is, um, it's, it's a very, my mind goes directly to one situation. So this was back in 2014, and um, Just Eat had gone public not long before, and I believe it was about $3 billion in market cap, and at the time, I mean, $3 billion is a wonderful outcome for any company, and at the time, it was really one of the few larger outcomes in Europe, so it was, you know, really a big deal. And um, one of my friends called and said, hey, I have this business school friend coming back, to, coming back to London. He wants to start a food delivery company. It was Will Shu at Deliveroo. And I didn't know how to get off the phone faster. I was like, another food delivery company. I, I'm not going to meet him. Anyway, so I didn't actually meet him then. And then I met him a bit later and still, still did not uh, dream enough at the Series A. And you know, you're going to laugh, but the question at the time was market size because Deliveroo was active in a couple of neighborhoods in London. And I thought to myself, you know, affluent neighborhoods, people who work a lot but have cash, is this really going to become a mass market proposition? Is everyone going to want to pay the two, three pounds delivery fee? And, you know, it turns out that convenience it really is a mass market proposition. People appreciate the extra 20 minutes to spend with their, ta to their, with their family or to do work or to watch Netflix or whatever it might be. People really appreciate that extra time. And it turns out they are willing to pay that, that um, delivery fee across the world, not just in London. And um, 
I did fix my mistake at the, f at the following round, um, and I worked with, uh, with Will for several years, and that was great. But I think ability to dream around what a market might become is my learning from that. Because we invest, like, we, we like to invest at seed, right? We invest really early. Oftentimes, those markets don't even exist. So being able to, to dream the, that a category might actually become something large, um, I think that's really important for an early stage investor. And you know, it's something I learned over the years. What was yours? I'm curious. Yeah, I think uh, for any, anybody who takes this job seriously, that question just brings up a, a huge list and you're trying <laughs> to sort it by you know, market cap missed or aggregate gain missed or most painful missed. Like, you know, what's the ranking mechanism? Um, you said your worst miss. So the one that, the one that sticks out to me uh, we came very close to uh, leading the series via Peloton, and it was personal for me because I was one of Peloton's first users. Mm. I loved the product then. I really believed in its future. The exercise equipment market was littered with carcasses of extremely mediocre companies. Mm. Um, and Peloton was just this unique thing that did live classes and streaming video and hardware delivered to the home. And it was really hard to figure out, you know, what might this business look like? And, you know, you fast forward, there aren't 10 Peloton-esque companies in the public markets. There's just Peloton. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's a really special business. And they thought about things from first principles, and they're willing to be different. And, uh, you know, the sad thing now is I still ride my Peloton bike, and, like, every day is a reminder of, like, hey, you, you, you know. Um, <laughs> But I think the last thing, it's quite similar. It's, it's um, you know, one of one companies exists, and when you find something that's just a little bit different, you should take it more seriously, not less. And number two is, you know, as a consumer, trust your gut, right? Like, if you really think a product is special, even if it is an exercise bike that was delivered to your house with streaming video from a New York City studio, and what is that? You know, that is... Um, uh, you know, worth viewing as a real part of the mosaic. I just want to say it makes a lot of sense that for Andrew it's a fitness company and for me it's a food delivery company. <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> Very good. So we have a couple of minutes left. And, uh, left. and to, to wrap things up, uh, you may know that Harry Stebbings was, was originally supposed to moderate this session, the host of the 20 Minute VC podcast and recently founder of the 20 VC funds, uh, I think it is at this point. So as an homage to Harry, I thought we'd do a quick fire round, uh, which he likes to end, end his podcast podcast episodes with. So I'm going to say a short statement addressed to one of you and give me your immediate sort of snap thought. So Andrew, favorite book and why? So before I answer that, I think we, hit, we do have a little bit of time left. I think on the topic of the Sequoia Capital Fund, we, uh, it was an immense effort and is an immense effort from a lot of people at Sequoia who just typically go unnoticed. You know, we have a small partnership of investors. We have many more people whose fingerprints are all over that. You know, it's obviously, the investment team and Ruloff, Doug, Mike, Jim, who are the inspiration for a lot of this, but it's our operations team, our finance team, our compliance team, our legal team, our tax team, our, op our communications team. It's a lot of people who typically don't get shout outs on stages like this. So while we have a little bit of extra time, I just wanted to say thank you to those folks. It's a lot of work still ongoing, and I couldn't be prouder to work with them. On the question of favorite book and why, uh, favorite book's Dune. It was a book I read when I was much younger and fell in love with it. And if you haven't seen the movie yet, it's the first movie I've seen that does a book like that justice. So uh, it's a, you know, it's a good book. Super. And let's be super rapid from here on. Luciana, what modern quote do you repeat the most often? Okay, so this is going to sound negative, but actually it has a positive twist. I, some, at some point very early on in my career, I heard someone say that companies die by suicide and not by homicide. And it sounds dramatic, but I actually think it's a very positive message, which is focus on what you, can, what you control, because actually as a founder as, and as a team, you control your own destiny. You know, what matters is your speed of execution, your product, how you hire, how fast you move, how ambitious you are, not what people around you are doing. And of course, your market needs to inform some of your decisions, but really a lot of it is actually under your own, in, your own, in your own control. So focus on that. So I actually think it's a positive twist, but it really stuck with me and I share it with my founders often. Let's keep going. Andrew, what three traits would you want your children to adopt? 
So I became a father five months ago, so this Aww. is congratulations. <laughs> um, kindness, optimism, and courage. Do you want to add one, Luciana, and let's end there? I, I think um, gr being grateful, it's something my mom always used to tell me um, whenever I got up in the morning, she used to wake me up as a kid, and she always said, be grateful for every single day you have. And um, I just think being grateful is, is really important. I think it, it helps you go through life with a different lens, with optimism, I guess it goes hand in hand with that. Awesome. Well, Luciana, Andrew, it's been our exceptional pleasure to host you here. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, everyone in the audience, for listening. We'll end here. Thank you so much for having us. We're happy yeah, to be you. here.